Africa, an enormous continent and both size and population, is often ignored in the conversation of leftism and leftist movements around the world. And in the light of this, I seek to do my best in the documentation of such leftist parties and movements, both historical and of now, and their faults, so we as Africans and also wishful spectators can derive knowledge and a new plan for conducting activities for our goals. Just a disclaimer, this video will obviously not go through every single leftist movement in Africa, just maybe the biggest ones and also ones I have deep interest in. So, you know, in the comments, please don't try to mention you missed this guy, you missed that guy. But I do plan on making a part two for this video because as Africa, with the most countries in one continent, is such an interesting place to discover and learn about leftism. And on some important channel announcements, we've started the new Discord and we're going to be doing some streaming as well. And there's going to be a lot of stuff that you can find out when you guys join the Discord. So I sincerely recommend you guys do that. And I'll be able to talk to you guys there a lot easier if you have any questions for the videos or any suggestions as well. Maybe the richest expression of socialism on the African continent, Tanzania is a must know when it comes to learning about socialism in Africa. Its history starts long before its independence. Obviously enjoying a form of primitive communism for thousands of years, as in any society, the tradition as such was never forgotten by the Tanzanian or other African peoples. In fact, the ideological leader of Tanzanian socialism, Julius Inyere, would clarify these yearnings of the Tanzanian people within the ideology of Ujamaa, meaning family or collective in Swahili. It outlines that our basic social unit is the family, not the nuclear family as such in other societies, but the common collective nature of villages and neighborhoods that was acquainted to hundreds of millions on the African continent. Because of the nature of colonialism, socialism as a reaction to it was never painted as a goal to move forward to in Africa, but instead a return to a higher form of society rooted in history. This can also be seen with the Peruvian communist Jose Carlos Mariategui's writings, where he declares the previous pre-colonial modes of production found within the Inca as a higher or superior goal for the Peruvian people and the imperative desire for the Peruvian socialist movement. This too was outlined in the writings of Inieri, and while Maria Tegui focused more on the Inca, Inieri would claim to go deeper with the familial or natural collective forms of production that were also interrupted by colonialism. Of course, this is an explanation of both the philosophy of Maria Tegui and Inieri that is too short and concise to wholly understand the two, so I recommend anyone to read up on both of their works. Inieri would declare Ujamaa to be the state ideology of Tanzania after the Arusha Accords in 1967, where the ideology was clearly outlined and went on to implement Ujamaa policies. Viewing the agricultural family and collective as the superior one, he would collectivize agriculture and move peasants to these new collective farms. Because of the rushed nature, though, and the tense political climate at the time, agricultural production did not increase with these farms but the population health of the average Tanzanian increased, as well as the literacy of the country because of the closer nature and more humanistic nature of the Tanzanian government towards the people themselves. And because of this, Tanzanians today revered Enyeri as their Mwalimu or teacher in Swahili. As for Ujamaa today, the party Enyeri founded, which was a merge of the Tanganyika African National Union and the Zanzibari Revolutionary Party named the Afro-Shirazi Party, would establish the state of Tanzania under the party of the Chama Chama Penduzi or Party of the Revolution in Swahili. Tanzania itself is a merger of mainland Tanzania or Tanganyika and the islands of Zanzibar, this being a part of the pan African nature Inyeri approved of and spoke of. Unfortunately, Inyeri would be ousted from power in an election in 1985 within his own party by Ali Hassan and Minyi and he would reverse the important social policies Inyere fought to keep in the country. Today, the Chama Chama Penduzi has strayed heavily from Inyereism and Njama while still being the ruling party of the country. It still maintains its iron grip and power as a one-party state, simply paying lip service to the foundation of African socialism that Inyere built. Used to the multi-party system, uh, don't uh, believe that a one-party system can be democratic or are rather suspicious mm -hmm. of the one-party system. 
We can't, frankly, convince them by sheer argument, uh, philosophical argument, that this is possible. Perhaps the best thing is actually to see this thing in, in, in practice. In the neighboring Uganda, a lesser-known East African socialist named Milton Obote, who was known as the student of Ujamaa, would become the prime minister of Uganda and theorized Uganda's steps into what would be known as the move to the left in 1969, where socialism would be undertaken in slow and incremental steps for the good of the people. This was written during the very, very hectic time period of both African and world politics during the Cold War. Unfortunately, Milton's rule would be cut short by an illegal military coup led by the famous Idi Amin, who had ravaged the country until Inieri responded with an intervention to return Obote into power. His party, the Ugandan People's Congress today, still finds itself troubled on the path of leftism. While some cadres wish to be more reformist and social democratic, others wish to take a radical direction for Uganda taking in Obote's writings with the move to the left and formulating it into the ideology of Oboteism. However, unlike the Chama Chama Penduzi in Tanzania, it is not in power and in fact, the Ugandan People's Congress is still a minor political party within the dictatorship of Yoweri Museveni. Luckily, because of the constitutional crises taking place within Uganda, as the illegal rule of Yoweri seems to be drying up day by day, Ugandans can find solace that the Ugandans People's Union can truly be the voice of the people at this time. My return would be a very symbolic uh, uh, sign in Uganda for national reconciliation. I played perhaps the biggest part in the removal of Amin, and I want to show it to the people of Uganda that I did this, not because of my position, not because of my party, but I did it because of the people of Uganda. By far the most famous Pan-African in history, Kwame Nkrumah is not only venerated in Ghana, but also throughout the African continent and diaspora for reasons such as leading the first African country to achieve independence from a colonial power, and more importantly, becoming the founder of the modern Pan-African movement that would theorize and perfect the various ways the rest of colonial Africa could engage in the decolonial struggle. This constant organizing for African liberation would culminate in the 5th Pan-African Congress held in Manchester, which would make the distinct shift of modern discourse for African liberation and decolonization. Before, the strong francophone old guard of African rights dominated the conversation for liberation, mostly those who benefited from the old colonial system, such as Blase Diane, the first black mayor of Dakar who would strive to see Africans under the yoke of colonial powers, just under the veneer of stated equality. But because of the force of nature that was World War II and its clear display of the fragility of the old colonial empires of France and the United Kingdom, and also the plain destruction of those in Italy and Japan, many African voices would reject Diane's line of previous Pan-African conferences and would actually adopt a militant resolution, all headed by Kwame Nkrumah himself, in the faction of British educated and radical intellectuals that defined the Congress of 1945. Kwame was the living embodiment of the divide between Francophone collaborationists who appreciated the nature of the French Union that advocated for equality amongst the West Indian, African, and Asian peoples found within the French colonial empire and between the Anglophone radicals who, like with Inieri and Abote, found solace in the Soviet model as a resort to unanswered calls for revolution and liberation. Fast forwarding, after securing the independence of the Gold Coast due to his radical declaration in 1945 and also the crumbling in nature of the British Empire at the time, he would rename the artificial name of the Gold Coast to Ghana, or Warrior King in Suninke, a language spoken in the Sahel and the seat of the Great Mali Empire. As the leader of the Young Republic, he would declare the Ghanaian seven-year plan, which was to transform the country to a modern state. And more importantly, he would declare socialism to be the intention for the newly transformed economy. Unfortunately, he would be ousted by an illegal and unconstitutional coup headed by the CIA years before his seven-year plan could come to fruition. This did not stop Nkrumah from his goals, though, as he would travel the world 
famously staying in Beijing and developing a friendship with Zhu Enlai, as he would theorize the various ways the rest of colonial Africa could attain freedom. And by the end of Nkrumah's life, most of Africa would see formal independence, but also under such a system which he himself coined as neocolonialism. This opens the second phase of the life and key importance of Nkrumah and differentiates him from strictly a Ghanaian or even African figure to a genuine literary genius whose work should be consumed by any Marxist worth their salt. Nkrumah would coin the term neocolonialism to describe the material reality that was facing the global south at the time. Seeing the shadowy financial cabals of the western capitalist sphere pull the facade of respect for African independence while clearly controlling the inner workings of said country. Here, he also jabs at the West's apparent dedication to world peace and denouncement of offensive wars, while he clearly saw the proxy involvement of capitalist powers in the governance of Africa, and often through a military way. To best illustrate neocolonialism today, I would point to Niger as a perfect example to a new learner of such an important term. Niger is one of the largest uranium exporting countries on earth and exports most of its uranium to France to supply its enormous nuclear power grid. While this should display a high stage of development for Niger, as any country selling such a rare and lucrative mineral should have, this is simply not the case and in fact, Niger is the poorest country on earth. While baffling at first, it is best shown by France's rapid deployment of political and military aid to friendly military regimes, implicit destabilization, and the parasitic usage of the West African franc, which strangleholds Niger's and dozens of other countries in Africa's economic potential. Now we can see why Nkrumah deserves the title founder by both founding Ghana itself and the founding of the written analysis of neocolonialism. And also with the title of the video, let's see the left that Nkrumah created. The Convention People's Party of Ghana, which still exists today, was the party that Nkrumah would lead as the head of state of Ghana, and even today, they seek to continue the legacy of Nkrumah. While many other African revolutionary parties, such as the MPLA or Frelimo in both Angola and Mozambique, would dissolve into a hyper-corrupt form of capitalism, only keeping the facade of leftism by finding legitimacy from the giants that helped found those parties, those being Agostinho Neto and Samora Machel, Despite being banned by the post-Nkrumah anti-communist military government in Ghana, it persisted as a revolutionary network until the country's liberalization in the early 2000s. Unfortunately, it is not able to draw the numbers that once did under Nkrumah, and many voters preferred to engage in the two-party dichotomy that Ghana persists with today, which it has been for the past two decades. There is an interesting period, however, in the 2008 crisis where the party won over 200,000 votes, but since then has fallen into obscurity. We are trying to reconstruct our economy and to build a new free and equal society. To do this, we must attain control of our own economic and political destinies. Only thus can we create higher living standards for our people and free them from the legacies and hazards of a colonial past and from the encroachment of neo-colonialism. Agostinho Neto differs from those stated before as he led a revolutionary organization that would eventually lead to the independence of Angola. Being the main literary influence for the creation of Angolanness, Neto is revered heavily by his people. For not only being a man of action and leadership during the independent struggle for Angola, in which he led successfully for, but also embellishing and cultivating the idea of Angolanness itself. Neto is known foremost as a leader for the most powerful and popular force that realized Angolan independence, the MPLA or in English, the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola. And also, he was a poetic revolutionary. In fact, Neto's famed oratory skills were very important for his cultivation of both the downtrodden and also the more cosmopolitan urban crowds of Angola. In fact, there exists a very interesting history between oratory groups between the three main independence movements, being MPLA with Agostinho Neto, Jonas Savimbi's group, which was called the UNITA, and also another group called the FNLA, 
where each of the group's leaders and lieutenants would perform speeches in front of onlookers and supporters, in which, due to his knowledge of poetry and being one of the most foremost African and Lusophone poets, Neto was able to draw large swaths of masses to come in and listen to his new and revolutionary ideas of a new Angola, and more importantly, putting the idea of Angolani Daji, or the idea of Angolanist national identity, into practice in the country. Angolani Daji is a very unique concept within the culture of Angolans, starting off as a form of passive resistance in order to fight back against the violently assimilationist nature of the fascist Salazar regime, it finds its origins in the capital of Angolan revolutionary activity, which is colonial Luanda. Filled with every facet of Lusophone colonial life, being white settlers, assimilados, who were black Africans who assimilated into Portuguese culture, mixed race and other non-assimilated Africans lived in both periods of prosperity and disharmony in the very cosmopolitan city. And by the late 1960s, disharmony gripped the city. Angolani Daji started off as a late response to the movement stressing black cultural outwardness in the turn of the 20th century. It differed from previous movements, such as in Francophone Africa with the Negritude movement, which was mostly dominated by African immigrants to France or Afro-Caribbeans, who mostly shed the trappings of ethnic identity due to either choice or the trappings of the French census, and simply referred to themselves as Black or African. The Negritude movement in the early 1900s would quickly make the distinction that it pertained to the entire African continent and the Black diaspora worldwide, rather than a force pertaining to specific nations within the continent. This is where Angolani Daji differs. While also stressing the need for a decolonial and fiercely independent cultural identity, this artistic movement filled with musicians, artists, and a field netto would dominate, poetry, would come to cultivate a feeling of national identity for all Angolans, regardless of ethnicity or tribe. Starting from the upper echelons of black figures in Luanda, Neto would make efforts using the MPLA and other organizations to, to disseminate the feelings of Angolani Daji to the rest of Angola and aim to burn away the continent-wide prevalence of tribalism. Because of this noble goal, Neto's largest opposition for the unity of Angola would be the organization of UNITA led by Jonas Savimbi and the FNLA both of which would make exacerbating tribal tensions as a way to drain support from the MPLA and to bolster their own forces. Luckily, and as a way to terribly summarize the civil war, Neto's MPLA would defeat these reactionary forces. Neto would die from cancer in 1979, leaving a successful revolutionary movement and one of the unique forms of national identity. Angolani Daji is also unique for the fact that it never idealizes a non-existent past, but instead recognizes the reality of post-colonialism and constantly and organically forms new variations of itself, be it in music, art, poetry, and now film. The actions done by Neto would not prevent the common trend of leftism in Africa. Due to the death of the revolutionary founder and the rapidly changing unipolar world led by America, the MPLA would wholeheartedly betray the legacy of Neto and return to a degenerated form of capitalism in Africa. Seeing an impoverished and war-torn country, the MPLA would authorize the exploitation of oil in the country, becoming a world petrol exporter and a member of OPEC. After abandoning Marxism-Leninism in 1991, the party had no problem letting the extremely negative effects of hyper-economic growth, such as high inflation rates, extreme corruption, and a government of inaction, whose degrees are often too little and too late to help any aspect of a fledgling nation. But due to this oil revenue, Angola is dependent on food imports, while holding many areas of fertile land and employment from these farms quickly dried up. An unprepared wave of urbanization quickly ensued and the already congested city of Luanda, the country's capital, with its shanty towns and urban squalor, became bombarded with the effects of such a high influx of people, and also the deeply corrupt and lazy MPLA government left the city's residents in a situation now where over 50% live in poverty and an extremely economically stratified society. This barely scratches the surface of the disappointing nature of the MPLA and the sad trend from the ANC to the Chama Chama Penduzi, where we see these African socialist parties soon squandered to the reactionary and bourgeois interests that not only betray the giants that founded these organizations, but also the people who they claim legitimacy from.
from looking at the history of leftism in Africa and also the specific movements that arose from them, such as Angola Nidaji, Negritude, and Ujamaa, and many others, we can see that the rousing of the people is not a hard task for the giants that have formed these parties. It is far from it. Instead, it is the internal betrayal that spells the doom for African socialism. This is the often tragic case with people like Julius Nyerere, Thomas Sankara, Agustin Neto, and many others who have seen their foundational parties for their countries turn to the same parties and organizations that these revolutionaries attempted to destroy in the first place. However, that is not to say Africa is a wasteland for leftism. That is far from it. We can see now that more and more African people are waking up to the fact that many parties that claim to represent them do a terrible job of doing that, and in fact are antithetical to their own progress. We see that now with Fred Mbembe, who is running at the time of recording in August for the presidency of Zambia under the ticket of the Socialist Party of Zambia, a party he has founded and is now enjoying widespread support from. In South Africa, the EFF or the Economic Freedom Fighters have quickly distinct themselves from the ANC and other so-called socialist or communist parties that do nothing more but squander the people. The protests held in Durban recently is one of the many expressions of disdain for the South African status quo in which the party of Mandela falls into corruption and blame. In Burkina Faso, Sankara's political parties were at the forefront in overthrowing the French puppet dictator of Blasé Kouampore. This all goes to show that leftism and socialism in Africa is very much alive in the continent, and in fact, is making its biggest resurgence since the time of decolonization. In the next video, I'll be discussing the various reasons why the argument can be made that Africa is not yet in her post-colonial phase in both economics and culture, and I hope to release that video as soon as possible, probably in one to two weeks. Afterwards, I'll be making the part two on this video and focus more on the modern movements in the African left as opposed to the history and the more archaic ones in this video. Other than that, until next time.